Welcome to the Tech Arena, featuring authentic discussions between tech's leading innovators and our host, Allison Klein. Now, let's step into the arena. Welcome to the Tech Arena. My name is Allison Klein, and today I'm delighted to be joined by research scientist Ryan Stoffer at NASA Goddard facility. Welcome to the program, Ryan. Thanks so much for having me, Allison. Happy New Year. I appreciate the invitation. Ryan, you are undertaking some important work for NASA's Shadows program as part of your work at NASA Goddard. Can you just start with an introduction of your role at NASA and how it relates to Shadows? Sure. So as you said, I'm a research scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. It's located in Greenbelt, Maryland, just outside the DC Beltway. I've been uh, in my current role as the principal investigator of the Shadows Balloonborne Ozone Sond Network. That's S H A D O Z Shadows since June of 2021. And so Shadows stands for the Southern Hemisphere Additional Ozone Sonds Network. And so it's a, a network of currently 14 active uh, balloon-borne ozone sound stations in the tropics and subtropics, basically covering all of the, the tropical area. And so they, they collect these balloon-borne measurements of ozone uh, about two to four times per month. Um, and so this, this network has been in existence since 1998. So actually we're celebrating 25 years um, of, of shadows measurements, and that actually this year, later in 2023, we will collect the 10,000th uh, one of these balloon-borne profiles. And so when you connect one of these small, lightweight ozone-measuring instruments to a balloon, it gives you the entire profile. So you're measuring ozone all the way from the ground up to about 20 miles or 30 kilometers up in the atmosphere before the balloon bursts and everything falls back to Earth. So those are the measurements that the Shadows Network collects. Now, Shadows is part of NASA's larger use of scientific balloons for atmospheric measurement. Why are balloons something that are effective tools for measurement? And why would you decide to choose a balloon versus another tool like a satellite? Well, yes, exactly. When when I tell people that I work for NASA, it, it's always a bit of a head scratcher for them because, you know, NASA is in the business of putting things into space and taking measurements of the Earth and beyond and human exploration. But the the reason that NASA is interested in collecting these balloon-borne measurements is because, well, one, we need to make sure that the satellite measurements are accurate. Um, and another aspect, maybe, you know, ozone is a really nice example of this is that when a satellite is staring down through the atmosphere it has to look through the ozone layer up in the stratosphere somewhere around 15 miles above the earth or so and around 90 percent of all of the ozone in the atmosphere is located in the stratosphere in the ozone layer so satellites have a very difficult time determining how much ozone is at the surface where we would say uh, ozone is polluted so ozone uh, the phrase we like to use is good up high, bad nearby. And if you want the mm -hmm. entire complete picture, you know, the, the ground level ozone where it's a harmful pollutant and the ozone layer ozone that protects us from the sun's harmful UVs, you need these balloon borne measurements um, to give you that complete picture. And the satellites are, are complementary to that. So today is the one year anniversary of the Honga Tonga eruption in the South Pacific. This was quite a powerful eruption from the seafloor, to say the least. Can you tell us about that and why it made shadows even more important to our science? Uh, absolutely. Just an enormous cataclysmic eruption that occurred at about 20 degrees south latitude in, in the remote Pacific Ocean. Uh, the really unique aspect of this eruption was not just its intensity, and it looks like it was the strongest, most powerful eruption since at least... 1991 with Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines. But the unique aspect was that it was an underwater volcano. So it blasted just uh, copious, enormous amounts of water vapor into the stratosphere, the normally very dry stratosphere. And so over the course of a day or two, the amount of water vapor located in the stratosphere over the entire globe increased by about 10%. So just uh, an enormous ejection of the water vapor. And, and so Shadow's role in, in monitoring this is that 
we already have stations set up near where the eruption went off. Um, we are, in addition to measuring ozone, we also also measure water vapor uh, in the stratosphere at many of, of these locations, and so we were able to track this enormous injection of water vapor into the stratosphere by measuring that, and also potential chemical effects that might cause uh, the ozone in the stratosphere to change. So we were able to measure that, uh, both the water vapor and effects on ozone, um, in particular at a location uh, called Reunion Island, which is near Madagascar. So right after the, the eruption, we were able to observe the effects um, and its, its potential uh, chemical ozone depletion as well. When you look at Honga Tonga, can you put in perspective how large of an eruption this was compared to other eruptions that we've observed over time? And what is the impact of having that water vapor in those uh, levels of the atmosphere in terms of impact to the health of the planet? There has never been in our record of observations over many decades this amount of water vapor shot right into the stratosphere from a volcano. Um, in the past, there were certainly more explosive eruptions, eruptions that might have placed a lot of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere, which can cool the planet. This in eruption from Hunga Tonga only injected a few percent of sulfur dioxide compared to, say, uh, Mount Pinatubo did in 1991. Um, and so Mount Pinatubo had an effect of cooling the planet. However, with an injection of water vapor, like from Hunga Tonga, that may end up slightly warming the planet because of the radiative effects of water vapor. Um, so it could warm the surface, but locally in the stratosphere where the water vapor is located, that has had an intense cooling uh, effect on the stratosphere. And so the southern hemisphere subtropics around 20 to 35 degrees south, for example, up around you know 20 kilometers or so in the atmosphere, those temperatures are at record low levels because of because of the water vapor. So it's having a profound effect on on our climate. I think it's you know yet to be seen exactly what the effect will be on surface warming, but we have already observed intense cooling in the stratosphere. Um, so it's been a really, really interesting case to follow. Interesting. Tell me a little bit about what the broader scientific community will do with the data that's coming out of your measurements in terms of understanding that broader picture and, you know, helping mitigate, is there anything we can do from a mitigation standpoint in terms of understanding what's happening to the planet from this eruption? I think one aspect that we'll learn a lot about is how air moves and circulation uh, is in the stratosphere because this water vapor is going to be up there for years. We're already at one year and it's clearly still observable from balloons from satellite measurements and and the water vapor really doesn't have for lack of a better term a sink uh, in the stratosphere mm -hmm. so it just moves around it's going to eventually get mixed down to the lower atmosphere where there's much more water vapor and so that enhancement signal will eventually disappear in a few years but we are going to learn a lot about how air moves in our upper atmosphere between, between now and then certainly. Now, balloons themselves are considered and, and may be viewed by many of our listeners as relatively low on the tech range of NASA's extensive tools when we think about rockets and satellites and everything that NASA has at its disposal. One doesn't really think about balloons, but you use balloons very um, specifically, and um, I know that you're using advanced technology in your research beyond the balloons. Can you give us some insight into the workflow between the moment that you launch a balloon and the types of balloons that you're using and um, how you gather the data from balloons all the way into publishing your results for the broader scientific community? Well, yes, the, the ozone sonde and, and balloon-borne instrumentation in general is considered fairly low-tech. Uh, I mean, the, the lightweight ozone sondes that we use in the Shadows Network, that technology has existed for around 60 years, actually. But it's it's a tried-and-true method. Um, we quantify exactly how well they work and exactly how accurate they are through laboratory measurements and other field experiments. One of the key advantages to balloon-borne instrumentation, which are actively sampling the air as they go up in the atmosphere, is that they're all weather instruments. They're not affected by clouds. They're not affected by rain. 
you know, rain or shine, essentially, you can collect accurate measurements uh, in this case of ozone. And satellites do not perform well um, with many types of measurements when there's heavy cloud cover. Um, and so ozone sondes fill that role. But yes, there's certainly a number of, of measurement platforms and um, computing modeling that all go into, I would say, complete the picture. So we launch these balloons, get a full profile of the atmospheric ozone. We compare it to the satellite measurements, validate the satellite measurements. The satellite measurements are often ingested into computer models, and then we can turn around and see how accurate those computer model simulations are compared to uh, the balloon-borne instrumentation, uh, for example. So all of these different puzzle pieces, I would say, get get plugged in to to complete the picture um, and so uh, validation exercises are are a lot of what we end up publishing you know we we quantify how well the satellites are measuring how well they compare uh, with the ozone sons um, and then ultimately how good are we at simulating atmospheric ozone through um, a number of models that that nasa and other agencies run Now, obviously, Honga Tonga is an acute example of why this science is so important, but the Shadows Network was well established when Honga Tonga happened. What are the broader scientific implications of measuring ozone in the layers of the atmosphere, and what areas of science um, tap your team's data for their broader research? So Shadows was initiated back in 1998, After a number of NASA aircraft campaigns, which are are measuring chemistry in the atmosphere, um, noticed some peculiarities about ozone in the tropics, and and in particular, this maximum that was located over the tropical South Atlantic. Um, So there was a lot of pollution that were measured in these campaigns way back in the the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and, And so one of the things that NASA realized is that there was really no established network of balloon-borne ozone sond stations in the tropics. These, these stations have existed in the mid-latitudes in Europe, um, in the United States, in Canada f- for 50 or more years, but there was nothing like that in okay. the tropics. Um, and so shadows, again, filled a gap in, in our measurement capabilities by providing ozone profiles in the tropics, a really critical area. Um, and so we don't think about just pollution with the Shadows Tropical Ozone Sond Network. We're also looking uh, for, for climate effects. Um, one, of the, one of the most recent publications we had um, from 2021 was looking at how ozone is, is changing. NASA and, and many other agencies are really interested in how um, ozone trends are behaving for the Montreal Protocol and the protection of the ozone layer, monitoring the health of the ozone layer, but also how pollution is changing and also what effects climate change has on those ozone changes. And so we found in this uh, 2021 paper that the the tropopause, the boundary between the troposphere where we live and where all the weather happens, and the stratosphere where the ozone layer is, that tropopause is actually raising in altitude because Mm. the surface is warming. And that has an effect on ozone. And so we were able to say, well, this... This change in ozone is a climate effect. It's not some unexpected chemistry. It's not an indication that the Montreal Protocol for protecting the ozone layer is failing. But we are literally seeing climate change's effects on on how ozone is shaping. When you look at the work you've done with shadows and you look at the opportunity with Honga Tonga, talk me through what happened when that eruption happened. Did you know right away that this was going to pose a real challenge and opportunity to your team to provide vital measurements of what was happening? Or did that come over time for you? Oh, my phone was ringing the night it happened. (laughs) (laughs) You know, immediately when you see a volcanic eruption like that, you you want to spring into action. But the eruption didn't turn out how we initially thought it would. Um, I mentioned that many volcanoes like Mount Pinatubo inject a lot of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere, which causes a lot of particles um, and cools the planet. This one totally threw us for a surprise by the amount of water vapor it had up there. And so I I mentioned previously that at Reunion Island near Madagascar that um, they collected a number of water vapor and ozone uh, balloon measurements. Um, And so that, that was actually a mini campaign where a number of scientists flew to the island 
um, just within a week and were able to capture the initial plume from this eruption as it went over Reunion Island. Um, and so everybody really sprung into action. Um, as I said, that day we were already trying to make plans to see how we could collect these measurements and, and how we could quantify the initial stages of the plume. And so that was a, the initial reaction to collect immediate measurements. And, and now it's going to be long-term monitoring. The water vapor will be there for years. We will be able to measure it for years. Um, and it's just tracking its evolution, comparing our measurements to satellite measurements, and, and, and learning more about how air is moving up in the stratosphere. Well, really important work, Ryan. Thank you so much for sharing your story today. The Shadows Program in, in Honga Tonga is, is part of a much broader effort um, from NASA in terms of measuring air pollution and our atmosphere. And it this area of NASA's um, purview doesn't get enough attention in terms of the, the contributions that you're making to understanding the planet. So thank you for spending some time with us today. I know that we've piqued the interest of folks who are listening online. Where can folks find out more about what you're doing and keep up to date with what the Shadows Program is delivering? Sure. Well, first, it was a pleasure to be here and speak with you today, Allison. Um, if folks want to learn more about the, the Shadows Network and, and our ozone measurements, um, I think it's easiest to just Google Shadows. That's S-H-A-D-O-Z, Southern Hemisphere Additional Ozone Sons, um, and it will take you right to the NASA Goddard um, web link. And you can find uh, all the information on Shadows. You can find our data. Our data are public open access so anyone can download them and use them um, and, and I would say yeah that's the easiest way is just uh, to google us fantastic thanks for being on the show today thank you Allison it's a pleasure thanks for joining the tech arena subscribe and engage at our website thetecharena.net all content is copyright by the tech arena 